Hi, part two. This is Monday, November the 15th, and we're starting our second last module, but this is going to be the last video because the absolute last module is the novel study, and I'm going to just post an interview with Maury. Um, I think that was on ABC at one point, and that will be for you to watch there. So I hope you enjoy Tuesdays with Maury. <clears throat> it's absolutely a beautiful story. Uh, if you haven't read it before and if you've read it before, you read it again with a different perspective. I think this is a book that's meant to be read many different times uh, in your life because um, it speaks so much in terms of wisdom and it speaks so much to the human condition. And the fact that Maury was a teacher is really relatable for us. And for me, it's a story about Eucharist. I, I, I see the sacramental, the strong sacramental element in this with between Mitch and Maury and Mitch coming to feed Maury whether it's through the food that he brings even when Maury cannot eat anymore they continue to feed one another so it really is a, a beautiful story of sacrament um, and once you understand the sacraments I know we're just leaving the sacraments module you start to see the sacrament of our lives right you know, and the sacramentality of the ordinary of our lives, the things we almost take for granted. If we stop to see the sacred in our lives, in our daily existence, in the minutia of our lives, you start to see sacrament everywhere. And that is the beauty and gift of the Catholic faith. Faith. Despite its brokenness, there's so much beauty. And I can go on, but I'm going to stop because I have to talk about scripture. <clears throat> so I hope you enjoy this. I hope you continue to journey with uh, with Maury. Uh, and I hope you share this with family and friends. And I hope you go back to this beautiful story at a time that you might need to get inspiration. And I hope someday you become someone's Maury. Scripture. So you're going to go back to Noel Cooper, Language of the Heart. I've got the old edition. I think this is one of the best um, uh, supplements to learning scripture because Noel himself taught these courses. Noel himself was an educator. And I just spoke to him recently about another, you know, uh, book he wrote. And um, uh, he just really is a phenomenal uh, person, educator, and man of wisdom. So... <clears throat> I would say this is a book that should be on your bookshelf. I'm still a book person. Call me old school. I'm not sure. But anyways, uh, I think we need books. So, you know, we're going to talk about the main book today, uh, the Bible. And I just think it cannot stand alone. It's got to have resources with it. So I'm going to start adding resources to the Bible. I'm going to create a bookshelf for you guys in this video. So, uh, what do you need to know? So you've already taken part one. You should be pretty familiar. You should have your own copy. I know I shouldn't should be, but it should into anything. But I really think if you're a Catholic educator, you need a relationship. And this is for us as Christians because we we only came into you know Vatican II in the you know mid 1960s. We were spectators in our faith, you know, like his faith was a spectator sport for us. So, you know, if we had a Bible in the family, really rarely was open. It maybe it was a family Bible. We didn't read it. Vatican II addressed the power of the laity in the church. And Vatican II said, start reading, start studying. I would have never gotten my MRE had Vatican II never started or um, uh, happened because <clears throat> I wouldn't have been allowed as a lay woman to study at the at the Toronto School of Theology. Okay, so make sure your Bible is NRSV. You know, that's the Catholic version. It's the new uh, standard, uh, a new revised standard version. The language is a bit more updated. So if you get a Bible that has a V, thou, it's an old, it's, it's not our version, you know, very similar, but not our version. So NRSV, um, is the same wording. So if you've got the green Bible that we have in the schools, it's the exact same wording. I like to use this when I'm working uh, because it's got so much more in it. It's got those introductions. It sets the scene. It's got um, great questions in it because it's helping us work with youth in this. I just added the tabs in this. You can add those in. You can buy them separately. It just helps me find things better because I'm Catholic. I can't find anything in the Bible. <laughs> If I was Protestant and converted, I'd be great. 
because you know they grew up with reading the bible and 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 knowing it and having a strong relationship and that's where we have to change as catholics right because we got kids going through our schools k to 12 and they come out and they are catholic illiterate because we're not comfortable with our faith in our bible so who's passing it on to our kids <clears throat> it's not coming from the home it's very you know uh fragile from the schools they're not going to church so we've got this amazing gift of catholic education and we cannot graduate strong young people of faith whereas you go to the protestant communities and they've got kids going to worship they're you know hanging out in community you know architecturally they, they they've done a better job like when i was working at father gates the uh, pentecostal or Pre no the Pr protestant church down the street where i used to uh have our kids run retreats they had the huge worship hall but right across the hall was a huge gym a full-size gym with a basketball court I love that. I love that. And downstairs, there were breakout rooms for kids to do different activities and music room and stuff. And this was their church, right? So even though Vatican II uh, changed the architecture of our church, like it flipped things around so that we're face to face and we've taken down the altar rails, we still need to architecturally create a space that's more community based right <clears throat> and it's up to us as the laity you know we can't sit back and say well our church doesn't offer this this and this and this and this all right so you're talking about that one priest <laughs> that's running the church and if you're lucky there's two priests in your parish that are running all the masses all the ministries everything that's required to run a church and a, and a huge community Right. Sit down and talk to a priest one day. Right. And ask them how busy their lives are and how they're on call 24 seven and how they have to go to drop of the hat to the hospital, to someone's house to to help people, to do things, to uh, to administer to, you know, the, the, the parish and everything that takes, you know, that belongs to that. And they don't have every gift needed. Not every priest is good with youth. Not every priest is good with the elderly. Not every priest is good with you getting my drift here? So we're expecting, as Catholics, one person, one person to do it all and be a fabulous homilist and a fabulous, you know, everything to everyone. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I wouldn't want that kind of pressure. Anyways, so we got to, you know, even though this started the shift for us, we're, we're not there. 60 years later... We don't understand this. And 60 years later, there's still a tug of war going on between Catholics to accept this or not accept this. And those who don't want to accept this seem to be winning the tug because those of us who are open to this are just like, you know, whatever, somebody else is doing this, right? Isn't this somebody else's job? Isn't somebody else supposed to be doing this? Oh, I'm not going to go because this is not offered at our church. Oh, I, just, I don't get community at my church. So I think I made my point. Uh, how much are you church? All right. Okay. Cause again, if you look to the, you know, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, Protestant churches, they got a minister for this, a pastor for that, you know, la la la. They've got all kinds of leadership going on and people involved. And that's why they're, they're, they're humming. They're, th you know, and kids want to go to worship, right? Cause you know, all these great things are happening. Okay. So where are the great things happening in the Catholic church? We're playing catch up, right? So <clears throat> Choose your Bible, have a Bible, you know, relationship with you, get to know the Catholic uh, version. It's okay to go to other versions once you're very familiar with yours and you can identify our tradition as Catholics, right? And I had said this, I guess at a Google me, you know, <clears throat> this is the greatest love story ever written. It's a love story between God and God's people. That's why this book is timeless. It will always be a number one bestseller somewhere, you know, at some point in time. Um, you know, the stories in here are created so that it applies to every generation. We just have to sit and meditate and interpret it according to our, you know, um, lived experience. And that's why the Catholic theology is so great. We don't take it, you know, word for word. We are call to say okay well now how does that speak to me today which is very different in a very healthy theology in a very healthy faith formation to say okay right but the unhealthy part of this when this love story turns into a weapon love story 
weapon. It's very easy to become a weapon. Why? Because people will take this out of context. People will take a line, a phrase, or something and say, see, I told you we're not supposed to do that. Or these people aren't supposed to live like that. Or, you know, it's so easy to take things out of context. But if you put that line back into the story and you start unpacking it with uh, a commentary to understand why it was written, when it was written, for whom it was written, and what was the purpose of that story. When we start looking at the catechism to say, well, this is what we're supposed to teach, right? So our library starts to grow. Our library starts to go. This is a Jerome Biblical Commentary. I, I bought this because I studied theology. It's huge. There's other commentaries. There's smaller commentaries that are just like, you know, one book at a time. That's Genesis. That's Paul, right? But for today, I'll just use my Jerome Biblical Commentary, right? Um, I already talked about the Vatican. You know, very few Catholics will have a copy of the Vatican, you know, two documents. But I do. So I can add that into my library. But I can't hold on to my library anymore. But you've got, you know, you've got um, Noel Cooper to add to your library, right? And then, I'm going to put my library down for a second because <laughs> I'm not well equipped yet. You know, <clears throat> there's a good concordance helps you too because, like, Oh, where is that in the Bible? That's why I always put the, I put the tabs in the Bible because I can't remember where anything is right. Because again, I didn't grow up that way. I'm not. I wasn't brought up in a Protestant uh, church, right, where they can like reference things at drop of a hat. So a concordance is great because it helps you find things in the Bible and it goes thematically. Okay, so I need to you know find scripture passages about. Let's see. Um, what would oh blessed are believe in the gospel. Um, what else do they have? They like actually baptism, um, you know, or like, you know, a lot of times we will want to, um, to uh, focus on things like light, something as a simple, simple um, uh, theme. Okay, I'm just going to go to light here for a second and see what it says. And they've got like themes like living in hope, living in God. Do they have light? I should have just like, you know, opened this earlier and, and tapped it or something, right? Oh, light. Here's light. Light from heaven. Light has come into the world. Light of the world. Light of Lord. You know, so if you, you know, uh, want, uh, for example, in Advent, you want, you know, themes on light or, or themes on Advent, right? And also exactly where in here there are references, both in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament or the Christian Scriptures. And they, and they, <clears throat> I'm going to drop my library on my lap. <laughs> They list it all, right? So it's great. You can have concordances uh, online. You can find a concordance online. Um, there's a, a, a small concordance in your uh, Catholic Youth Bible. They actually include one along with maps and stuff. Here I am trying to... Oh, and my library is getting bigger. But it's just an awesome library because it helps me to become a good Catholic educator. It helps me to reference things and to... You know, use because I don't know everything. I have to look stuff up. <laughs> you know, I'll never get rid of these books, right? Okay, I'm gonna put my library down for a minute because I can't hold it. I need more muscle for my library. So this is this is this is part of as you're you know going through part two. Probably gonna go into part three because you want to be an admin or do you want some other leadership role? You know, can you lead through faith? Can you like if you become an administrator? You are the faith leader of the school, even though you may have a chaplain, even though you might have a great parish priest that comes into the school and helps you out. You will be the faith leader of the school. <laughs> Remember that. Is your library going to be full of, you know, administrative books? You know, uh, yeah. But is it also going to be full of faith books that help you reference and become a better faith leader. Hmm. You might even have this on your shelf. Yeah. No. Anyways. So scripture is, is, is usually done at the beginning. So this course, it's the end. It's, it's very unusual, but, um, but anyways, we land in scripture. Um, I, I love this. This is a, you know, I subscribe to this. It's also on my phone as an app. Uh, I think every Catholic educator should read the Gospel of the Day. So it's like, oh my goodness, you know, I don't have time to read or study theology. Yeah, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> I mean, I've got a, a master's in religious ed. I still don't know everything. People can study like one 
book their whole life, never mind the whole Bible, right? Um, it, it takes a lot of work and we can't all be proficient. But here's a shortcut. Read the gospel every day. That's it. Let it set the scene for your day. It takes 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds top. Depends how tired you are in the morning, how fast you can read. But you plant the seed of God's word in your consciousness as you start the busyness of your day. And as your day unfolds and things happen, la, 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 la. And then like bits of this reading might come back to you through the day. It's like, oh, I read about that this morning. Or when you come finally to the end of your day and you're about to go to sleep, pick it up again. <clears throat> Take the last 30 seconds <laughs> of your energy and your consciousness, reread the passage. And then go to sleep with that sort of calming, you know, um, God's embrace in, in God's words and just kind of let your day sort itself out through God's word and not through stress and tension and oh my goodness la, 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 I can't sleep I love this so of course we're going to end with this right and it also helps you like you'll know what the saint of the day is so we're going to be doing the gospel for Monday November 15th the saint is Saint Albert the Great you can go into the back of here and I'll tell you a little bit more about Saint Albert the Great okay and he's actually a patron saint of scientists and Thomas Aquinas was his um, was a student of his that's kind of cool very smart guy as are many people in the church who discovered things. He discovered some things. Uh, he, was, he's, uh, he was given uh, the title of Doctor of the Church in 1931. No, 1931. I forget the date. I'm bad with dates. Anyways, read about it, right? And also, if you're not sure where we're at, because we're coming uh, at the end of our liturgical year, right? So we have that the, the readings are going to start to sound a little apocalyptic, right? And we end with Christ the King on the last day of, uh, of our year. And the first day of the liturgical year is the first Sunday in Advent. So we can wish each other happy, happy new year on, on the first Sunday of Advent, because that begins a new liturgical year. And we have a different focus. So this year, we're still in year B. I hope you can see that. Okay, so that's we, we focus on Mark, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three synoptics, right? So when we start in the first Sunday of Advent, we're going to be in year C, and there's going to be a focus on Luke for the year. So that's how you can learn more about your scripture. Just say, okay, um, I'm going to start learning about Luke this year. So I'm going to start the first Sunday of Advent. I'm going to take 30 seconds. Not every reading will be Lucan, right? Mostly on Sundays. But I'm going to do that. And then maybe I'm going to get a commentary on Luke. I have my commentaries on Luke at home. And maybe as I read the, the, the passages this year, I'll also take a look at commentaries to see how much more I can get out of that passage, how much more I can learn. And that might be hmm, five minutes a day. Not much. You have to break it down to bite-sized bite -size pieces. Okay, so these are the things and these are the things you should be going through with your students. You should they should be aware of the fact liturgically where we are as a chaplain. And uh, when I started the new school, St. Mike's, I made sure every classroom had a green, a white, a purple prayer table cloth. My God, it used to drive me crazy when I used to go into classrooms and it was every color under the sun was on that table. It was hard for teachers, even though I made announcements and emails like, okay, change your cloth. We are in this cycle. We're in this, you know. It's exhausting. But anyways, I tried. And so should you. <laughs> All right. So what are we learning in part two? We are learning about um, uh, the prophetic voice in, in scripture. Right, so we started our first activity after introducing ourselves was to define leader, follower, disciple, prophet, and we come back to that because that's all understanding how the church works, how we as leaders also have to be good followers, and how we're all called to discipleship. And through our vocational call, we have the potential for this prophetic voice to reach our students in our classroom, in our ministry, in our church, because we'll be the only church for them. We can be that prophetic voice if we understand scripture. 
if we unpack it with them daily, if in our wisdom as we grow older, because there's no way I was wise at 23 when I started my first classroom and like, geez, how did they even give me a classroom at 23, right? But that wisdom grew. But even at 23, there was wisdom that the kids saw in me, right? That I didn't even realize. Because simply just because we're older and we can share that wisdom. But my wisdom got better and stronger because I started to study. And I was able to bring in the wisdom of life, education, culture, um, media, everything. Because my worldview was 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 formed through my stronger faith and through my knowledge of faith and my understanding of theology it's a lot and we haven't had that for a long time so don't be hard on yourself right vatican ii mid 60s it's, it's only 60 years in the in the history of the world in the history of our faith in the 2000 years since we've been christian in the 2000 4000 years since we've been in this relationship with god it's only been 60 years publicly funded catholic education since 84 have the laity taken over the the religious have slowly left our schools with their leadership and their knowledge and everything they gave us in our school system they gave it to us and so we're playing catch up like we have to have that knowledge of of faith somewhere in our schools and that's why there's the masters in religious education programs developed by universities that have theology you know and those are basic masters graduate disease Disease, uh, degrees, right? So anyone, like I didn't have a theology background. I had a history mate. I was a history major, but you're able to take that because it's designed for people like you and me to become stronger theologically. And now it's even better because it's online. It's easier. I had to travel all the way downtown. I had to do all 20 courses. If you've got your part three, you only, I think have to do like 16 courses. I'm talking about St. Mike's, right? But also, I mean, I, I I was blessed. I got to take one of my courses in Mexico, and uh, we looked into social justice and uh, hands-on, you know. So that was kind of cool too. So so if you have opportunities to study and and travel, that's that's fantastic, right? Um, <clears throat> so. You know, when we're looking in part two, we're starting with uh, Deuteronomy. You know, we're looking at the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Moses, right? Moses, and, and, then, and then the last prophet we look at is Jesus. There's parallels, right? Moses, Jesus, uh, Hebrew story, Christian story. <clears throat> um, Moses was the, the liberator, the deliverer. Jesus is the liberator, the deliverer. Moses, you know, with the whole Passover experience, the blood of the lamb, saved people from slavery, got them out. Jesus is the lamb of God, delivers us from spiritual slavery. And we get Eucharist from that. So Eucharist, the whole concept of Eucharist starts in, you know, with Moses and, and the Hebrew story and the Passover experience. And then it, and, and it, and it comes to fulfillment in the story of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection, and that we are become a people of the resurrection, and that Eucharist, that like to me, Eucharist is that main sacrament for all of us, because we engage in it, hopefully, at least once a week, if not, you know, whenever, right? And then as a school community, that's the sacrament we all engage in all the time throughout the year. We go to school mass, and that's why we have to understand Eucharist, be Eucharist, see the world through Eucharist, because we have to prepare our students to come down, engage in this, in the Mass, and receive Eucharist, and to understand the power of that sacrament, the power of the moment that we are engaged. Okay, you know me. Okay, I go off. Eucharist. Love it. Anyways, we need to know it better. So, Deuteronomy, um, you can do, like, portrait of a of a prophet like just go into that deeper knowing what a what a prophet is the writing prophets get to know at least five of the prophets in the old testament because we can go our whole lives and not understand who they are and all prophets were um reluctant right moses was reluctant he's like oh my gosh don't pick me pick aaron my brother you know i've got a speech impediment people aren't going to listen to me take aaron you know he can speak well he's good looking people will follow him but god's like no i'm going to take you moses 
because I see greatness in you and you're going to be, you know, my voice, even with a speech impediment. That's beautiful. You know, uh, I'm a Jeremiah. I was a young prophet. No, not me, God. I'm a young, I'm young. I'm young, right? But then we see some of the young prophets in our midst, right? Um, Greta, you know, uh, with climate change, who's also autistic. The world started listening to her, right? Um, you know, and then there are kids in your school that I'm sure have very strong prophetic voices too that you need to tap into and help them shine in their leadership and give them confidence, right? Uh, women, so many strong women. I will post some uh, on the news feed, right? Uh, there's this one woman, a sister Elaine McKinnis, I love her. She's a, she's a nun, but she's also a, a Buddhist um, Zen master. Still a nun, but she works in the prison system rehab with rehabilitating our, our, those who are incarcerated, um, you know, through meditation and prayer. And, you know, she, she's just beautiful, beautiful, right? St. Paul, we wouldn't have a church if it wasn't St. Paul. The biggest, you know, like he was, he was, he, he killed Christians. He, he sent them off to their death <clears throat> and had this huge conversion experience. Right? So think of someone horrible in prison right now, <laughs> some horrible violator of human life, and they have this huge conversion experience and they become God's voice. Oh, you know, that was St. Paul. And he went out there. He was like the first blogger, you know? And he was like, if you listen to his readings, he's like the cheerleader. I thank God every time I think of you. You know, this is how he starts. I love, I love some of, you know, his, his, how he introduces some of his letters. But then he comes down hard on them when they're not following. And Paul was very adamant that Jesus was coming immediately. And you can see that in his writings. To get our acts together. Work for, work for the, the cause. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay? Right? And then, of course, Jesus, the greatest prophet. And even in terms of other world religions, Jesus is acknowledged as a great prophet, right? So, so our Jewish brothers and sisters acknowledge Jesus, of course, you know. There's also Messianic Jews. But they believe that, 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 that God has not come. So we're waiting for the second coming. Jesus comes again. And our Jewish brothers and sisters are waiting still for the initial coming. So they don't recognize Jesus was the first coming, right? Even in, in, in Islam, right? Jesus is regarded as a great prophet. So they don't, you know, just kind of erase him. But Islam thinks it's now the complete, right? That, that, that they take it beyond Christianity and Muhammad gave the final great teaching and, the, and, 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 and had, had, you know, written God's word into the Quran, like he scribed for God, right? As opposed to all the writers of the, you know, Christian Bible who, who, who told the stories of Jesus from their perspective, they believe, you know, Muhammad really wrote God's words, right? But there's also an interesting fact, we talk about women in the Bible, like, that don't get a lot of, uh, are highlighted, it, like Mary, Mary is like, oh my goodness, Mother Mary, the strength of, of her presence in our world today, she continues to be a presence, she's active in our world, like her power is incredible. And that's why the rosary is just such an important part of our lives and our meditation and our prayer and our relationship um, uh, with, with the sacred. Right. But it's interesting in Islam, uh, Mary's actually uh, mentioned more in the Quran and there's a great reverence to Mary. And uh, if you go to Ephesus in Turkey, where her the, her house is, the Virgin Mary house, that is a huge pilgrimage place for Muslims, not just Christians. It's a pilgrimage for, for Muslims. So it's interesting. Once you start studying, it's, it's fascinating. Anyways, enjoy this. I'm going to put an end to this because I'm going too long. I want to pray with you guys. Uh, this is our final prayer together. And I want to continue to pray for the needs of our community. Uh, as we kind of, for some of us, we're hobbling through this course. It's been a tough semester, a tough start to the school year. We're really struggling. So that's why, you know, some things got changed in this last module. Um, and But we just need to, we need to make it through. So we need to pray for each other for that strength. It's not getting any easier. We don't know where this pandemic is going to go this winter. So we need to continue to support each other with, uh, with prayer. 
So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight, as I mentioned earlier, it's the Feast of St. Albert uh, the Great. And this reading is taken uh, actually from Luke. Jesus approached Jericho. As Jesus approached Jericho. So it's important to also know there's so many little nuances in Scripture, eh? So the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, we hear that word Jer Jericho a lot, was called the way of blood or the bloody way because it was a dangerous road. A lot of bad things happened, right? Um, so people were, were robbed or killed or it was a very treacherous, treacherous road. So as Jesus approached Jericho, a man who was blind was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want of me? What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> the man said in my dramatic reading, the man said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed. Even the word immediately, when you study scripture, that has significance, but I'm not going to go there. Um, Regained his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, praised God. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope, I hope, I hope in this course, somewhere along the way, some of our blind spots, some of our blind spots in faith have been lifted. And every time we study, every time we read God's word, a little bit of that blindness gets removed from our faith because there's so much that we don't know there's so much that causes us anger there's so much that causes us like to question God's existence especially if we're hurt especially if we're grieving especially when life is so difficult we question God's participation in our lives but it takes faith to really see God and, look, and, and you know in today's gospel we need to get that our sight back right to see God God bless it's been such a pleasure to work with you guys and um, I'll give you my final words on the email good luck and uh, I hope your faith journey continues I hope I get to work with some of you guys again in part three peace